Welcome to Wager Talk TV. I am Kelly Stewart, joined today by the man himself, Teddy Covers. And we're going over top threes today. Starting off right out of the gate, Teddy, how do you deal with the losing streak? Well, let's start with this, Kelly. You had them. I've had them. Everybody's had them. They're going to happen. It doesn't matter how good you are at this, how bad you are at this. Losing streaks are inevitable. All right. They're a part of the process. There's something that we all deal with. Doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Losing streaks can and will happen. So the first thing I do when I'm in the midst, I lost yesterday and the day before, and I just can't. The first thing I do is I breathe. (laughs) And that sounds silly, but it's true. When you're losing, people get wound up tight, tight. Exhale and breathe. Take a step back. Take a day off if you need to take a day off. That's something I do sometimes when you're really struggling, when you're not seeing things clearly. Some guys like to go to the movies. I like to go hiking. You know, if I want to get my mind off of this stuff, I'll go up into Red Rock or up into Mount Charleston and take my mind off it. But when you're struggling, when you're losing day after day, you got to take a step back. You have to breathe, take a step back, take a day off, and then reassess. That's how. That's at I, least tip number one when it comes uh, to struggling. Yeah, that one's the hardest one for me. Uh, (laughs) always the hardest is to get out of your own head. Uh, But once you're able to do that, at what point in time do you start recommending somebody to cut their unit size? So when you're not seeing things clearly, if you're betting a percentage of bankroll, your wager sizes are going to go up and down. And when you're seeing things clearly, you're going to be betting more. And when you're not seeing things as clearly, you're going to be betting less. So what I would encourage you to do is to make sure that your unit sizes are appropriate for your current bankroll. So if you started out, whatever, $1,000, and now you're down to $500, your unit sizes need to reflect the fact that you have a $500 bankroll. So the one thing that a lot of beginning bettors do, and I'll talk about this more in just a minute, but a lot of beginning bettors, when you're struggling, you're betting more instead of betting less. And the opposite, in fact, is true. If you're not seeing things clearly, the last thing you want to be doing is raising your unit sizes. It's okay as long as you're betting percentage of bankroll consistently. Just keep doing that. And if your bankroll declines, your wager sizes decline. Very good point. It always reminds me whether you're betting sports or at a blackjack table. As soon as you start to press, guess what happens? It gets even <laughs> worse. Uh, speaking of pressing, that's almost like chasing Teddy. And we all have a horror story or two under our belts about our younger years where we did some really stupid things like chasing our bets and uh sounds like yours might take the cake well look i mean again we've all been through this the fact you you and i kelly we've been doing this for 20 30 years so we've had these experiences around the backside now we learn from them i'm sure that many of our viewers have not yet had these experiences the same way so it's important to emphasize some of these points and i can't say this any more clearly than this don't chase the Reggie Miller game. People still talk about it, right? <laughs> when Reggie Miller, uh, uh, you know, had the steal and the three pointer and the steal and three pointer at Madison Square Garden to beat the Knicks. That was my double or nothing game. I had the Knicks in that contest. Yes, the Lawrence Phillips game. I had a nightmare bowl season, a true nightmare. I'll tell you what, it was 1995, and I lost and I lost and I went double or nothing, double up again, double up again. It all came down. I put everything. I've been losing the whole bowl season. Put it all in the national championship game. Lawrence Phillips in Nebraska against Steve Spurrier and Florida. And that game, it was over in the first quarter. I had Florida. Nebraska won. I think it was 62 to 14 or whatever. It was over. And I spent the next two months working for my bookie. And that was the point in which I said, you can't do the double or nothing. You can't bet on the stuff that you don't know. That to me, was a, it was a seminal moment in my betting career in terms of learning not to chase and not to bet more on stuff that I knew less about. So don't chase of all the things, you know, when you're, when you're adjusting your unit sizes to reflect current bankroll, chasing's out of the equation. That's the discipline you need to have in order to deal with a losing streak. See why Teddy's the best. Right now you can take 25% off one of his daily or all access passes up to one full year using coupon code TIPS25, T-I-P-S 25, one per user. So make sure you guys use that one wisely. Teddy, top three tips, how line shopping actually makes you money. I might have to argue with you on this first one. Let's hear it. 
I love it. I want some pushback, Kelly. That's a piece of the equation, you know? And if you have opinions, you got to defend those opinions. My number one opinion when it comes to line shopping, look, line shopping will make you money, all right? And the whole point of this video right now is talking about ways that you can make more money doing what you already do. Half points matter, all right? They matter across sports, NFL, NBA, college hoops, whatever. You win games by a hook sometimes, you lose games by a hook sometimes, and certainly those half points factor into so many betting decisions. But there are people out there that want to buy half points. They look at the line and says, oh, well, you know, it's uh, three and eight. I want, I, want, I want to make this three, or I want to make this four, or whatever it is. If you do this right and you shop for lines, you don't need to buy points ever. We'll talk about why in just a minute. But number one tip is don't buy points. Don't lay 120, 125, 130 for stuff that you can get for minus 110 if you just have more books and shop around. Oh, I agree with that. But let's just say on the Wager Talk odd screen, the market is painted three and a half on an NFL game across the board. We know that three is the most key number in that sport. So talk to me about why some people, whether they're sharp or not by doing so, insist on buying the three and a half down to three. The whole point is that if you want a three, all right, and you have multiple books to shop from and all week to find a three, guess what? If you're paying attention and the three exists, you're likely to be able to find it without buying the half point. Now, Obviously, key numbers in the NFL and two and a half, three and a half are the keyest numbers that you can find. But when it comes to how the books price buying those half points, there's no bargains there, my friend. There aren't, Kel. The books price buying the half points on or off of three at such a level that they make a profit off it. That's all you need to know. They say, sure, buy all the threes you want, but they'll charge you for it. And that makes it a positive expectation bet for them and a negative expectation bet for you. And the whole point is you don't need to buy these points. We're going to talk right now about how to find them for free. 38 states now. It's crazy to think just in the last, what, six years since PAPSA got repealed, Teddy, that many states are on board. And basically all but one, that would be the state of Florida, have multiple outs. I love this quote from you. Uh, it basically says, hey, these guys aren't loyal to you. Why are you loyal to them? And that baffles me. People are like, oh, my favorite sports book is this. This is my sports book. I live in Las Vegas, all right? Sometimes I bet at the Circa. Sometimes I bet at the Westgate. Sometimes I bet at the South Point. Sometimes I bet at the Station. Sometimes I bet at William. There are, it depends on where the best number is. I'm not loyal to any of them. Just not there. Just like they're not loyal to you. What do books do when you win? They limit you. They kick you out. They give you trouble. They're not loyal to you. Books don't give two bleeps about you. And you know that. I know that. So. People are loyal to books. There's zero reason, zero reason. If you're in a book, if you're in a state that has eight legal sports books, you should have eight sports betting accounts. If you're going to put a thousand dollars into account, put five hundred into two. Two put two fifty into four. Put one twenty five into eight. There's no reason to lock yourself into a single sports book or two or three when you can have every one of them. And the advantage of this is, guess what? This book's got three and a half. This book's got three. Oh, look, there's a three there, a three minus 20. Bang. I just got that three, and I didn't have to pay. I didn't have to buy it and pay minus 30 or minus 30 or 40, you know? So there's zero reason why you should be loyal to books in the sense of, oh, this is my book. Have an account everywhere that you can have an account at. And that's how you get free half points on every single game that you bet. I would have to agree with you there, Teddy. Usually the market starts to uh, vary from book to book, especially come game time, depending on which each, well, we'll say which each uh, casino needs and or whichever bookmaker is begging you to bet a certain side. We'll leave it at that. Begging for money, we see it a lot, uh, especially now in Las Vegas. It's wonderful to see and very advantageous for us. Speaking of advantageous, Teddy, let's talk about those little edges and uh, finding, well, we'll call it finding some value, if you will, over the long term. Well, again, we're talking about how line shopping can actually make a big difference on your bottom line. Take 100 bets that you make, all right? 
let's say you win 54, you lose 44, and you push on two. Okay. Little 1% edges, 2% edges. You turn two of those losses into pushes and maybe the two pushes into win over 100 bets. Now you're 56 and 42 with a couple of pushes. Over the long term, when you add up your wins and losses, it makes an enormous difference. Over 100 bets, over 1,000 bets, over 10,000 bets, over many years, those little 1% to 2% edges, heading, getting the half point here, getting the free half point there, taking advantage of what the markets are giving you. Over time, those edges make enormous differentials for your bottom line. And that's as simple as it gets when it comes to how line shopping can actually make you money. That's what we're doing here at Wager Talk, making you a better, better. If you want to join in with Teddy right now, you can get 25% off one of his daily packages or his all access pass up to one full year. That's three, seven, 30, 90, or 365 day packages. Tips 25, T I P S 25 is your coupon code. Teddy, top three tips betting the NBA after the all star break. This is when I start to get involved because, well, we all know the regular season isn't for the faint of heart, but it looks like you actually have four tips here. Yeah. Well, you know, I got to throw one bonus one in there. Uh, I can't help myself. You know, you start typing it up and you're like, yeah, top three tips, maybe type four tips for this one. That being said, my number one tip, and this is pre all-star break, post all-star break, regular season NBA. Number one tip. I want a smaller market team under the radar. That's playing good ball. I mean, who's the number one? The number one example this year is the Orlando Magic. All right. No superstars, small market, haven't been a playoff team. They were the single best point spread team for most of last year. And they've been right among the leaders again here in 2023 slash 24. The small market under the radar squads that don't get the national TV games and don't have the household names when they're playing good basketball, they'll make you a small fortune because the markets don't catch up with these teams the way they do with the higher profile squads. In the month of April, May, uh, end of March, month of April pretty much, until we get to the finals, a lot gets talked about on uh, all of these television programs about seeding. You don't think it's important at all. Shit, I'm seeing seeding talk already. All right, you know, and it's the middle of March right here. And again, Never forget, there's what, 50 million NBA TV shows and 50 million NBA writers out there, and every one of them needs a topic for every single day. So what do they talk about? They spend a lot of time talking about seeding. In my experience, betting the NBA long-term, seeding doesn't matter as a motivator, not even a little bit, not even to get out of the play-in game, all right? It's factored into the point spread. It's never say, oh, well, this team wants to move up from the sixth seed to the three seed. Yeah, they do, sure. It's a regular season game. If they end up in the sixth seed, they'll be just fine come postseason. It's not as much of a motivator on the floor as it is as the markets react to it and or the pundits react to it. In my opinion, talking about seeding is a surefire way to lose money after the All-Star break. I think this one is worse, Teddy. When the pundits <laughs> say, must win. This is a must win game. Sure. And we see that again across sports. You know, we love this in the NFL when it's December and this is a must win team. And you know, they're not that good. The reason it's a must win game is because the team's not that good. And this is, I mean, I, I'm going to say this tip in, in as, as easy as I can say it. Must win does not mean will win. And any must win situation is certainly factored into the point spread already. So honestly, you know, the seeding that the pundits talk about, the must-win game that the TV talking heads went about, uh, talk about, as a better, you're better off ignoring, completely ignoring that stuff and focusing on stuff that can actually make you money, like betting on the under-the-radar smaller market squad that are playing good ball. Let's talk about teams that are tanking. I always get a little bit of pushback on this because just because the ownership wants them to tank does not mean the players want to tank or maybe they're playing for a contract extension or to get traded to another team. So let's talk about tanking in terms of being able to beat the NBA market. Sure. And this is a big difference in sports. All right. 
in the uh, cross sports in the NFL. All right, the, your tanking bottom feeders aren't tanking because there are you know fifty three guys in the squad who are all playing for jobs, and you don't see teams let go of the rope the same way. And of course, only one game a week in the NFL. But in the NBA, when they're playing three to four times a week, and you have a team that's clearly you know one of the bottom feeders, the effort isn't there, the defense isn't there, the coach isn't going to be back, and you say, oh, well, let's find some value. Yeah, we can find some value with the Washington Wizards. At plus, there's never enough value with the true bottom feeders in the NBA. And I know that the players themselves aren't tanking, but the effort and attention to detail isn't there for the bottom feeders down the stretch. Like, oh, plus 13, plus 15, plus 18. In most of these spots, I'd rather be laying the points than taking them. When you have a team that's collapsed, they're unbackable, in this better's opinion. There ain't no value to be found on bottom feeders who aren't playing with full effort down the stretch of the NBA campaign. He is Teddy Covers Tips 25. You can join up with Teddy for a one daily package or an all-access pass up to one full year. Coupon code TIPS25 at Teddy underscore covers on Twitter. You can catch him every single day here on Wager Talk on Wager Talk Today.